Okay, hi everybody. Sorry for the uh, change of scenery, change of background here. I am in a hotel room because I am out traveling this week. And I don't know if you noticed, but I've been trying to get out three to four videos each week. And I realized, shoot, I don't have a video for today, Wednesday, as I'm recording this. And I don't have a video for tomorrow, Thursday, when this video will be released. Uh, and to make matters worse, here's really the problem. I have a presentation tomorrow. I'm here on Travel for a Trade Show. And I'm going to be giving a presentation. And I thought... Okay, let me try to get two birds with one stone here. I will record a video preparing for the demonstration, and that way I can prep for the presentation and do everything that I need to do to get the content set and prepare the demo. And I thought, okay, hopefully that'll be fun. Maybe that'll be good. We're kind of getting back to old school, maybe shady, scrappy, I don't know, uh, in the good old days when I would record from a hotel room. So that's what we're going to be doing in this video today. But first, let me give some love to this video's sponsor. Uh, Sneak has been an incredible team to work with. They've always been super kind and generous, and especially under understanding when things like this happen and hey I am out and about I'm AFK even though hey, you know my keyboard's right here but I'm just uh not able to get you know the regular studio setup so hopefully this still looks and sounds good thank you sneak and I'll please give them some love link in the description if you want to join the party see everything they're up to let me roll the promo thank you sneak there are so many vulnerabilities out there like prototype pollution SQL injection remote code execution and more they're fun to play with in CTF challenges, pen testing, and ethical hacking, but they're not so fun when they're in your own applications. And that is where Sneak comes in. Sneak automatically scans your code, dependencies, containers, and config files, finding and fixing vulnerabilities in real time. Here's how easy it is with Sneak. You can sign up for free with my link below, import your repositories, and there, Sneak just finds your vulnerabilities. And it's not just looking for old deprecated libraries. Sneak literally found a serious command injection vulnerability in a project of mine. So all I have to do is fix it with a single click. Sneak will open up fixing pull requests so you can just merge them into your repository and move on. And it does this all from your existing tools. IDEs, the command line, repos, pipelines, Docker Hub, and so many more. And you can see for yourself. Check it out and find out if there are any vulnerabilities affecting your projects. It's all totally free, and you can sign up using my link, sneak.co slash John Hammond. Huge thanks to Sneak for sponsoring this video. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit meta because I only have one screen here working off my laptop, but I have to give a presentation tomorrow on PowerShell. Uh, I'm going to this conference, and it seems like a whole lot of folks are chatting about PowerShell. They all seem to be, you know, talking about all the things that you might be able to do with it, whether it's automating your workflow, whether it's dealing with specific things, whether it is... Uh, actually, you know, being a little bit of a power user, being a sysadmin and getting stuff done with that automated command line tooling. So uh, I wanted to showcase the dark side of PowerShell or using it for malware, using it for cybercrime, seeing how hackers might be able to take advantage of that powerful tool, right? Hey, you've got this command line utility that lets you automate and remotely handle processes and do so many things with configuration management, etc. But, you know, threat actors and adversaries like to do as much shenanigans that they tend to do with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be spinning together a little Windows 11 virtual machine. And that's what I have up here right now. Uh, and I need to stage some of the content and some of the demo portions that I want to be able to kind of pull out of my hat as my little bag of tricks to showcase and hopefully make that fun and a good presentation. But uh, I need to go ahead and stage all that. So that's what we're doing. Oh, this needs to do. It's like... OOBE shenanigans. Uh, okay, cool. So this looks good. Uh, it looks like we just have the regular desktop, but I want to be able to make this text a little bit larger so that way people can see it, you can see it, and the audience when I pull this thing together. Um, I might as well take a snapshot of this as it is right now, especially because I just, you know, made a new clone of this. So let me take a snapshot uh, of fresh clone, zoomed in, perfect. Uh, and I want the terminal to be set up and staged. Good, good, good. And now for my presentation, uh, we go through a little bit of cheese, you know, hey, talking about what PowerShell is in case folks haven't seen it. Probably gonna speed run through a whole lot of that because this audience basically already knows, obviously considering a whole lot of the other presentations are chatting about PowerShell. But uh, these things that I wanna showcase, like actual presentation pictures of code and things that you know it might be able to put together, uh, these are just screenshots. So I'd, I kinda need to hand jam these into the virtual machine and then put together this code. Uh, the first thing that we end up showcasing is actually using PowerShell uh, and calling C-sharp code or working with other managed code for like a .NET assembly. So what I'm gonna do is open up ISE and then 
start to slap this code together. Okay, so if folks aren't familiar, what I'm doing here is just assigning a variable. The dollar sign prefix will denote a variable in thin PowerShell. And the at sign surrounding the string is actually gonna make this a multi-line string. So that way I don't need to have any specific like new line characters or tabs, or I guess back ticks is the escape sequence in PowerShell. Uh, but we'll grab some regular C-sharp code, like, oh, using system to be able to import modules that you might end up using, using system runtime interop services, and then we go ahead and create a class. This class is gonna end up defining the DLL that we might want to load or reference and work with inside of our C-sharp code. This way, PowerShell can be made more powerful. It's actually going to be able to import and work with specific Win32 API calls. Like, oh, some shenanigans that might allow you to uh, change the background, which you could very easily do without, you know, the Win32 API calls. But you could do things like hide windows or manipulate uh, systems and services and processes and users, etc. Or some shady spooky stuff, like actually go ahead and inject shellcode or do, uh, you know, some process injection. Things that will normally be nefarious and used by a potential threat actor doing bad, bad stuff. So what we do here with this syntax is just defining this is basically what you need to be able to call and refer to a function that you want within a DLL. So we're using user32 DLL. Um, and calling the message box function within it. This is just the prototype of the function given its regular C types and its comparison to C sharp stuff. You could use whatever Win32 DLL you might like. You could use something like, oh, WLAN API to work with wireless profiles. You might be able to actually go ahead and retrieve, you know, clear text Wi Fi credentials, some stuff that would be worthwhile to start up a PowerShell runtime in case you want to get past constrained language mode and other things. I guess I don't need a semicolon there because it's just PowerShell. So now that we've defined that as a specific variable, we can go ahead and use add type, which will go ahead and basically use the C-sharp code to create some managed assembly that it could work with within the context of this PowerShell shell. Uh, we'll reference that namespace user32 because that is what we've defined as the class here. And then we can call or just straight up run that message box function. For the hardware window, or excuse me, the handle to the window, we can just pass in zero. And then the string of what we want to include here, I'll just use hello world. Uh, and then we'll add the title C sharp inline within PowerShell and the type can just be zero for a basic message box. So now fingers crossed, if I run this thing, oh, I'm getting the cannot be loaded because running scripts is disabled on the system. Easy enough, we need to go ahead and open up the Windows terminal and fire up PowerShell as an administrator. And then we can just go ahead, and I realize my face might be in the way here. So uh, let me go ahead and move this so it's more visible. We'll go ahead and set execution policy to be remote signed. Uh, that way, hey, we'll be able to run actual PowerShell scripts that we write uh, and only things that are accessible or downloaded from the internet if they are signed. Now I should be able to go ahead and run my script here. Hit F5 again, and I'm crashing somewhere. What do we got? User32, message box, zero, hello world, C sharp inline within PowerShell, cannot add type, compilation errors occurred. What is the issue? Oh, car set does not exist. So that needs just need to be a capital S, I believe. Run that. No, still not working for me. System runtop interrupt DLL does not contain a definition for set last error. That's what that needs to be. Try and run that. And does that even need, uh, that doesn't need 32 there. I don't know why I typed that. I was probably saying it out loud. How about that? Hey, there we go. Now we get our hello world dialog box. And that is running C sharp within PowerShell. Now, uh, I want to be able to showcase this a little bit more because what we do for the demonstration is explain that what this does is actually calling the csc.exe command line utility, which if folks aren't familiar with is just natively, I think I might be able to run it. I don't know if it's in my path. No, let's go find it. Let me move into C and let's look for csc.exe. Let's see if find will be able to track it down. That is the C Sharp compiler. That's a command line utility so that you'll be able to just go ahead and, you know, run C Sharp code, build and compile it and put it all together. There it is. Looks like it's in uh, WinSXS. 
Uh, and that is the command line utility that we might end up calling back to. Uh, but add type does that. It ends up passing the code back to it, which, oh, and actually that is uh, what they're referring to here in that platform invoke for the p invoke syntax. That's what we were putting together inside of our, our syntax here. Using this DLL import is something that you could very easily find within p invoke. Let me pull that up if I just search for p invoke. P -invoke .net should have all of this sweet syntax that you might be able to put together for uh, grabbing and using specific Win32 API calls um, and getting their structures and enumerations and variable types and everything for specific uh, calls. So if I drill down into user32, uh, obviously on the left-hand side here, you can see everything that we might be able to use from that library, from that DLL. And let me search for message box. There it is. Cool, so now you can see that C-sharp signature. Exactly this code is what we end up using so that we're able to pull that into and run our own PowerShell code. But the explanation is if you specify source code and you use add type to compile that source code, it creates an in-memory assembly that will contain those new .NET types. And this, if you wanted to dig into it on lolbins or a lolbass, uh, if we actually pull that up here, and I want to have that ready to showcase for the presentation. Uh, if I search for csc.exe, notice how you can use that to compile specific code. And it shows you where in the paths on a Windows file system you might be able to find it. And then it actually shows you some syntax that are used in, to compile that code. Native, inherent, just straight up on my flat, vanilla, basic Windows 11 virtual machine. Now, csc.exe actually ends up writing temporary files to disk. Let me open up uh, Microsoft Edge uh, and just ignore, I don't, I don't care, man. Please just let me go. Uh, and let's get sys internals. Oh, here's a Discord message. No, go away. Let me close Discord. Congratulations, Ronnie, you made it into a video. Let me go grab sys internals here. Bing, get out of here. Just take me to Microsoft, please. All right, sys internal suite, let's download it. There we go. Look at that hotel Wi-Fi. Cruise it. Is my face in the way for that? Totally. <laughs> Cool, now that we've got that downloaded, I wanna be able to extract all of these to a quick and easy location. Let me just create a new folder in the C drive called sysinternals. Oh God, I can type, extract, there we go. Okay, so now that sysinternals is set up, I wanna use procmon, uh, that's the help file. I wanna be able to use procmon and it should be procmon64. Totally cool with the EULA. Let me kick this thing off. That does need admin permission, so that's why it fires up uh, the cheesy UAC, user account control. Now let me add a filter where I wanna look for the process name is csc.exe and then include that. Let's hit apply. There we go. And now with this open, oh, did I click on PS exec? No, it should be good. Let me run ISE again to run this script. There's a little hello world. I believe this might have already compiled, so maybe that's why I'm not seeing anything. Or unless it's doing some other magic that I'm not thinking of. Let me go take a look in temp. Nope, not seeing it. Uh, what if I change this? Can I use like a, here, let me rename this file. Let's do a save as second.ps1. And now let's add like a little bit more white space or something so that I can recompile with a different source hopefully. And let's just change hello world. Run that. There we go. Look at all that. Here's some CSC syntax. CSC.exe is running, cruising through it. And let me show you how it ends up pulling in and dropping some potential files over here. All right, this is it. See, it's checking out, yo, let's get our user local admin, let's check out their app data, let's move into local temp, and then you can see this random file is created here for the command line of uh, running this. This randomly named file is some of the boilerplate stuff that it just ends up using. So it is leaving some fingerprints behind. Let me see if those files still exist. Uh, I went to see Windows temp, but let me go to my own temp with the environment variable. And it is local, creating .cs, creating a temporary DLL file. And do I happen to have that Z syntax still here? No, I don't. Does it delete the file afterwards? Let me go check it out. Or maybe it's a hidden file. Am I, am I seeing hidden files right now? Let me hit view, show, hidden items. Oh, what you got for me? Still no. 
app data local temp. That's where I'm at, but I don't have any Z file names. All right, might've cleaned it up. No sweat. Honestly, this invocation of csc.exe is still what I want to get across to them. So I think that works just fine. I don't think we need to go too far into it, but noting that it writes to disk, that is when we start to explain a little bit more of the malicious activity. And if I were a hacker, if I were a threat actor or an adversary, I would want to improve upon that tradecraft. Uh, so I then start to showcase how you could not write to disk or avoid writing to disk by doing something special. Hey, so I'm sorry, uh, this video is running a little bit long because obviously it's a different kind of style. It's me, you know, going in cold to some that I just need to get done. Uh, and it's explorative. It's me just not thinking and just, you know, charging through with what I need to do. And I'll probably just cut this off here because this thing's rambling on and, you know, I'm not doing the best job of uh, thinking through or talking out loud everything that I do. If anything, I hope you had a little bit of fun and maybe learned something new. I think I've showcased this a little bit in some other videos, but it wasn't in its own encapsulated thing. So fingers crossed, this was still a little bit of a good time. Thanks so much for watching. Maybe you'll check out the other video, but uh, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks. See you later. Bye now. Until next time. Goodbye. See you later. Roll the ad. Thank you, Sneak. I love you. And you too.